the to here we go. And then I'm going to share the screen and it's over to you. But I'm just going to, to introduce Emily. You all know about Emily's work. She is just, you know, the font of, of, of all knowledge about the Cuban economy. She explains things to us in a way that makes it simple for even the numpties like myself that struggle with it. And Cuba is in a very, very complicated situation at the moment. You just have to go there to realize just how complex it is or talk to people in Cuba and realize how complex it is. So I know that Emily's going to shed light on that for all of us. Thank you so much, Emily. We really, really appreciate it. Over to you and I'm going to share the okay, screen. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't know how much light I'm going to throw on it, but I will at least, um, yeah, the presentation I think will give us a chance to, to have a discussion about it. So I just thought I'd just go through through this in three, three parts, just look at the macro conditions, the, the kind of external factors that are determining the economy, which I think people are, you know, this audience are very familiar with. And then to, to go through the reforms and in a way what I, why I think they're important and what their importance is. And then briefly what we can say about the prospects. Obviously it's difficult to um, predict anything in the world at the moment. Um, and Cuba's no different, uh, except that there's um, a lack of data uh, for even for 2021. So we're trying to go on anecdote observation and whatever information we can get. I mean, there's some there's some data that we can use anyway. So it's, um, if we can move to the next one. Now, first of all, obviously, sanctions is a big thing. Um, and you know, the official estimate is that sanctions have cost $150 billion. I think, and I've said before that I think that's probably an underestimate. Well, it's bound to be an underestimate because it's just based on um, identifiable uh, costs of the sanctions and not on the things that didn't happen in terms of the economics um, that could have happened if um, there hadn't been sanctions. This chart was one that I just saw presented last week by Seda Barrera and Ernesto Dominguez um, in Oxford. And they have put together, they've added up all of the um, measures, the sanctions, and then the, the relaxations over all of these years from 1996 to 2021. Um, we know that before 1996, there was a Torricelli and the, the Helms Burton happened in 1996. But basically just adding up the numbers of measures taken there you see this chart and you see that the only year in which there was more relaxation um, than tightening, the only years were the Obama years um, from 2015 to 17, um, or to 16. Um, and then under Trump, of course, you've got the increase again. And as we know, in 2021, Biden surprised everybody by not shifting at all. And I've written here, the biggest blow was in January 20, 2021, which was just before Biden took office, Trump listed Cuba on the list of countries who were state sponsors of terrorism, which has an enormous impact on all areas of trade and finance. And that has a greater impact than it used to have because of the, the architecture of, of anti-money laundering um, that now exists in the world. And so it's been, it's been really devastating. So last year was, um, the year, if you like, when they suffered the sanctions most um, since obviously the early 90s or 1960s. So that was one, one thing, the sanctions. And then the next slide shows the impact of the pandemic. Next slide. On tourism arrivals. The red lines are just the January, so you can see the years. You can see that there was a decline already starting in 2019 because of the measures that have been taken um, by Trump. But then you saw, you see that disaster of 2020, and then a slight pickup towards the end of 2021 and going into the, the current situation. So that, that shows how steep it was um, and you know, the disappearance of tourism, which is an important component of foreign exchange earnings. In 2020, of course, the Cuba was controlling the pandemic very well. And it wasn't until 2021 that it started to get um, to, to leap out of control for a while in the middle of the year. So anyway, the next one is, next slide shows 
macro conditions in terms of the global economy. And here we're looking at prices of Cuba's essential imports. The first one shows um, the World Food Price Index. And you can see compared to 2020, if you look at 2020 in um, March, April, May, World Food Price Index was somewhere around 90. And by 2022, by now, it's 160. So that's a massive increase in food prices. The next chart shows oil prices, and you can see them rising from around $20 a barrel to over $100 a barrel. Also a massive increase. Now food and oil together make up half of Cuba's total import capacity is spent on food and, and fuel. And then you've also got freight prices. And then you've, you've got a huge increase there from under 2000, I can't, I'm not sure, quite sure what the unit is, to you know around 8,000. So um, all of this has had, a, would always have had a devastating effect on the Cuban economy and you know, looking from afar, we've just been looking at it with horror. And from within um, Cuba, you've clearly seen the impact. Um, if you go down um, to the next chart, it shows the impact. And you can see between 2018, 2019, there was a fall in foreign exchange earnings due to Trump. And then you have this massive fall. And so that by 2021, you have total foreign exchange earnings, um, almost half, had fallen by almost a half compared to what they were in 2018. And if you think that half of total spending is on food and fuel, you can see what happened to the spare parts and all the other things that had to be bought um, in Cuba. So it is a devastating effect and you can see the effect also on um, GDP as well. Um, there, the, the orange lines show annual growth in GDP, and the blue line, which is on the left-hand axis, shows the level of GDP compared to 1990. Um, so we're not down to 100, we're not down to you know, 1990 levels, but it's a dramatic shift and a huge shock. So, but we all know that. And the next slide shows the result. Next slide, which is massive queues. Um, shortages of everything. Um, and so, this has also been combined. And so now we're going to talk about the reform. So there's huge shortages. Um, they existed in 2020. They got worse in 2021. And partly they got worse in 2021 because of the huge um, reform introduced in January 2021. Um, while I believe that the Cuban government, like everybody else, believed Biden, Biden was about to do some relaxation, as he promised, but he didn't. Um, and so you have the, the reform, the monetary reform. So on top of the shortages that there were, there was the impact of monetary reform. Next slide. Um, and so it was, it was called, uh, what's it called? Re restructuring, re reordering, monetary reordering, um, or monetary realignment, I think is probably the best translation. So the official exchange rate went from 1 to 1 to 24 to 1. And that meant that the Kadeka rate, the rate that was used by um, on the street by the private sector was actually unchanged. But the rate used by state entities, that's enterprises and um, state bodies of all sorts, was changed to 24 to 24 to 1. And that meant that state prices all had to adjust. So all state enterprises had to adjust their prices um, in order to try to make a profit or break even with these new relative prices. So if you're a bus company, you previously were importing your oil at one-to-one -one, um, so that the peso earnings were worth one-to-one -one compared to the oil import prices that you had. Um, suddenly uh, you had to change the prices to try to break even, actually not, not in the case of public transport because that's a public service, but other state enterprises had to do that. And so the prices leapt up. Um, they weren't liberalized and that's very important. So each enterprise, each entity had to adjust their prices in consultation with the planning authorities. So you have a process of radical price adjustment throughout the economy, which the state is attempting to control. Um, so with the relative prices adjusting, the idea 
was that state enterprises and state entities could now actually meaningfully use accounts to measure whether or not they're efficient, whether or not they're profitable. Whereas before, foreign exchange was always allocated centrally and um, the actual amount that they reported as profits using the old, very distorted exchange rate didn't really um, have much meaning because there was, it didn't accurately report actually the cost of production compared to the revenue earned. Um, what they did at the same time was they hiked up wages by three to four times in the state sector. And then in state enterprises, um, pay is linked also to profitability. So the people that got hit hardest really were the people in the private and the in informal sectors um, because their pay didn't rise automatically. So they had this price shock at the same time as they had a collapse in tourism and earnings from there. And so the private sector contracted very, very sharply. The government allowed people to suspend their licenses so they had no, hadn't, didn't have to pay any more taxes, but their incomes just evaporated. Um, so together with the increase in the money supply, that's the big M, with the uh, increase in wages, that plus the reduction in supply due to the external shock. So inflation was much worse than it had been anticipated. So the government had expected there to be inflation, obviously, because otherwise they wouldn't have increased wages by three to four times. Um, but so the inflation was much higher and the unofficial value of the CUP, the street value or the black market value declined rapidly. So whereas before the 24 to one rate was the accepted rate for everybody, there wasn't, um, a difference between that and the informal um, rate or not a significant difference. So the value of the Cuban peso fell to steadily really um, to end the year about 100 to one instead of the official 24 to one. Um, and then the efforts to control prices. So the government would be putting on caps on prices. They'd be telling suppliers or even um, in the private sector, the, in the markets that prices shouldn't be exploitative and so on. And they tried to control prices, but all that meant was that either that the suppliers wouldn't supply as much or that things would shift into informal, even the informal markets um, and people would still have to pay extortionate prices. In fact, the informal prices were probably more than they would have been in the formal sector. Um, so this effort to control informality just led to all sorts of creative ways to jump queues. It led to um, frustration, resentment from one person to another, resentment of the authorities that were trying to stop the supplies from coming through, um, and conflict between different people and huge uncertainty. And so we have um, the fear of accelerating spirals. So that this in the mid 2021 was when it was actually hit its worst. In the summer, it's always summer when food is more scarce because of the seasonal nature of um, uh, the growing seasons. Um, so you had July the 11th, which everybody here knows about, I'm sure, and the surge in immigration that we've seen um, in the last few months as young people thought, you know, the US is never gonna change by prospects in this country are awful. Um, and so there was a big push towards emigration and illegal immigration because the US wasn't honoring its um, migration agreements. Next slide. Um, okay, so on the other reform, so that was really on, on the monetary side, on the, on the demand side. On the supply side, a lot of really interesting things have been happening in the past year. Um, and the main focus on it, what's been noticed most internationally is the um, expansion of the list of permitted activities. There, there used to be a list of things that you could do if you were self-employed. That list has now been replaced by a very small list of activities that you can't do, do if you're self-employed or if you're in the private sector. So now it's been opened up, the private sector has been opened up. And beyond that, in September um, last year, the new law, long awaited law, long promised for the legalization of small and medium sized, well, micro, small and medium sized ent enterprises or MIPIMES. Um, so the legislation has arrived and um, which has opened the prospect for Cuba to have a new 
a real private sector. Before it was all self-employed and people who'd be self-employed would work together, but they're all officially self-employed. Now it opens up the relationship between the employer and the employed, um, company owner and the, the workers in them. That has actually given rise to a need for a huge amount of work to integrate between the actors. So there's supposed to be a level playing field between all of these different kinds of enterprises, state, private, large, small, self-employed, um, cooperative, different kinds of cooperatives and all the rest of it. And they're trying to make the level playing field. That involves a whole lot of work to change rules, to change the way that procedures um, work and a whole lot of learning. And they keep talking about a cambio de mentalidad or whatever, a change in mentality of people because it, it means everything is done differently than it ever was before. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there's a whole load of in innovations which also deserve um, closer um, monitoring, scrutiny, understanding. And one is the local development plans that each municipality has to develop its municipal development strategy. It's also, um, there's been a devolution of control of budgets so that the central planning system is now being radically decentralized. Not only are state enterprises um, becoming um, autonomous, using their own accounts to determine whether there will be investment or how many people they employ or, or, and so on, um, but also that the, the government is being devolved to the local municipal level. Um, that's a process which is, um, being rolled out as we speak. Some municipal governments have moved faster than others. There's a process of learning and training and um, reorganizing that's going on. But as that happens, again, it's a change in mentality of people in terms of their involvement in, in economic development. And the idea is that this should improve um, participatory democracy as well. The second innovation I've listed there is university enterprise links. I was in Havana in February in the Universidad um, International Conference, and you can see there's a huge amount of work going on in every university is now being required to link up with the local economy and to share knowledge with, um, with the enterprises, with the municipalities in order to, to build this uh, local development strategy and to upgrade Cuban industry in every possible aspect. So as far as university people are concerned, um, there seems to be an awful lot of activity there. Now we know how demoralized people in universities and local governments have been for many years. They're now at the center of everything. Um, incubators are being set up uh, in universities, in municipalities to support and encourage and teach and train um, these new enterprises. And these enterprises, there's a kind of a, mis, a misperception that this is just private enterprises. This is also state enterprises and cooperative enterprises. So their state enterprises are being reorganized. Sometimes they're spinning off private enterprises. Sometimes they're sort of contracting out to smaller enterprises which continue to be owned by the state. There's a, a whole plethora of different ways of organizing which are being developed um, as they go along. FDI, foreign direct investment and international finance. There's a new focus and procedures there. Um, and in particular, whereas previously the focus was always on large businesses because they were easier to monitor really. Um, there's now a push towards local enterprises, small enterprises, private and public, looking for international sources of funding. The systems the procedures for doing that aren't really in place. They're being developed, but this is um, happening and it's something that um, we um, in Cricket, my organization, um, are looking at and are involved in that process. Um, and then in economic management, I think everybody will have seen here this kind of idea of review and response, review and response. It happened with prices. So prices are monitored. Then there's a negotiation. Should they adjust them? I put especially food because in agriculture, there's been an overhaul of prices. It's not working properly. There are lots of complaints about people in agriculture finding that their inputs um, costs are not covered by the prices that they're required to sell at and so on. So there's a, a process of negotiation that's constant there. And the 
I'll say the poor people in, in the public sector are being required to work an awful lot harder than they were before because they're required to be responsive um, to so many complaints and um, suggestions and um, requests for changes and adjustments. So this is a kind of a, a shift towards a responsive bureaucracy. This is a new thing. Okay, next. Um, so prospects. Okay, first of all, I want to put some positive news. There is some positive news. I had to look quite hard for it, but I've, I've found it. Um, well, first of all, we all know in the last week, um, finally, um, the US government has announced a slight easing of sanctions. It's not completely clear how far reaching those are yet because we haven't seen the regulations. Um, very belatedly, they say they're doing this for the Cuban people. Why they didn't do it a year ago is um, an interesting question. Um, so that is happening and that has a huge effect, I suppose, on um, morale within Cuba because it's the first time there's been a shift. It looks like it may have been prompted by two things. One of them, the migration surge, but also this whole question about the summit of the Americas and whether or not Cuba was going to be invited. So there's been a review of policy and the US has decided to, to ease up a bit, only a bit. Um, and then there's a post pandemic. I say, obviously the pandemic's not over, over but tourism has returned. It's creeping back. It's not bounced back right to where it was before. It seems to be quite slow. The depends on, on planes coming in and all the rest of it, but it's, it's happening. I was actually in Havana in, in November and then in February, and it's quite clear, you know, things are coming back to life. Things are really starting to move again in Havana. But of course, you know, that's, it takes time for that to, to spread out beyond that. Also, the impact of reform, I just read today or yesterday that vegetable production is actually exceeding the plan, which is really an unusual thing. Um, so there's all sorts of all of these uh, revisions of prices, this reorganization. We're talking about um, small farmers are actually growing more vegetables than they did before. It had to be said that meat, milk, cheese, eggs, all of the, the, those products are not performing well, but I think this may be a bit of a process of readjusting because those um, food products that require a lot of imported inputs are gonna have more trouble than those that are more um, dependent on what they can produce within Cuba. And this is part of the restructuring of the economy that really needs to happen. Apart from the fact that I'm vegetarian, but anyway, it's um, the shift. Cuba has actually a very high meat consumption per head um, and that's because it's been subsidized. Anyway, so there's also been hundreds of new enterprises popping up all over the place. Um, and the municipal development strategies are emerging. They're beginning to um, take effect. In February, we went to visit some of the things that are happening in Mariana, which was really quite impressive. Um, obviously, they can't do things with imported inputs, but with labor and with organization, they can get a lot of environmental improvements to make things look better and it's creating um, useful work in the public and private sectors. And the efficiency gains are starting to happen but very gradually. Um, and the combined impact, um, I just had a report today, somebody pointed out to me that the Cuban peso has appreciated radically in the last week, which is obviously in response to the um, news from the US. But it's also a reflection of the, the very low value of the Cuban peso was a reflection of pessimism. So this is a return of hope. And I think it's, it's appreciated to something from somewhere like around 125 Cuban pesos to the dollar to somewhere around 100. And then the person that wrote, sent me this information said you could even get um, a dollar for 85 pesos in some places. So that's really a very sharp adjustment on the basis of not that many tourists coming yet, not that many people traveling from the US yet, but just because it's now on the cards that that's going to happen soon, the exchange rate has changed. But it has to be said, prices are still high. They, there are still electricity cuts and shortages are, are persisting and summer is coming and summer is the hardest season. So, you know, it's not all good. Next. Okay. so. In terms of prospects, what's the idea? So a lot of, there's a lot of discussion. This is really opening up the discussion. 
what the Cubans are trying to do is to progress towards an independent, sovereign, socialist, democratic, prosperous, and sustainable nation. All of those things. Um, and that is in caps, uh, is it, was that something you said? You said, hurry up. No? no. Okay. I didn't say anything, Emily. It might have been somebody else who was not muted. <laughs> hurry on, <laughs> carry on. And don't hurry up, please don't. Okay. Um, anyway, and that's in, that's sort of springing from this whole process of rewriting everything, the, conceptualiza the conceptualization, the guidelines, lineamientos, the plans, economic plans, and the constitution, all of those are incorporating this new vision of what is um, Cuba's new model. Next. So what exactly is this thing? And this is the discussion that I've heard a lot. So decentralization of control, is that strengthened participatory democracy or is it the end of socialist economic planning or what um, many of us understood to be socialist central planning? Um, the autonomy of state owned, owned enterprises, is that more efficient and more efficiency and productivity for larger and more resilient economy or is it the growth of new capitalistic state enterprises which are um, unaccountable and profit maximizing? Um, and will do all of the things that um, private state, private enterprises do. And is the growth of the private sector going to stimulate creativity, innovation, better quality goods and services, or is this the thin end of the wedge and um, actually liberalization and conversion to capitalism? Um, those are the questions, they're, they're open questions. Next slide. So here we have, so this is the agenda. Is this, my question there, is this the fourth way? Is this like the third way is supposed to be adapting capitalism? Um, and this may be the fourth way is adapting the socialist economic system as we understood it. What are the principles and practice? So, so we've got the principles. Those are the prosperous, sustainable, independent, sovereign, socialist and democratic. Um, and they, have been incorporated into all of these initiatives. So Cuba has um, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. It's, it's integral in their plans and so on. Tarea Vida, the, the climate change um, response, Mi Costa, similarly, that's the coastal uh, management. National Plan for Food and Nutrition, which all of these kind of correspond to the SDGs, but also correspond to this, these principles of the Cuban um, model or aspiration that you've got. Um, there's also something called a science and innovation general management system, which is this thing about integrating universities with local economic planning and enterprises, and there are legal reforms and so on that's going on. So finally, and this is my last slide actually, I, I, I found this cartoon, go back again, um, which is from 1961, which was about you know, this new economy that they were gonna have, and there they were, they were communicating the new ideas, and then they were sitting there puzzling it all out and talking to their friends. And, and then finally that moves on to, you know, creating a new world. Between introducing the idea and setting out the principles and having the improvements, there's a hell of a lot of work that's going on. Um, so I'm just sort of presenting here my, um, my research project. I'm intending to go to Cuba as soon as possible to do a bit of digging around to find out actually what's going on on the ground. Um, anyway, so that's all. That's it. Questions, ideas, contributions. Thank you very much, Emily. Hold on, let me make myself visible. I think even before you'd ended, Jackie had a hand up. I don't know if that's intentional or not. Um, did you have your hand up? Yes, it was. Yeah, because I saw it was the last slide. Coming up. Oh, she's getting in very quickly there. <laughs> Excellent yeah, strategy. No. <laughs> okay, yeah. go ahead, Jackie. Anybody else, you can use the chat. Um, those yeah. of you who are arriving late, I'm really sorry. We had to switch to Zoom from Jitsi. But it's all being recorded, I hope, so you can catch up with it later. So over to you, Jackie. First of all, Emily, I want to really thank you for, like, you know, it's a monolithic task to, uh, well, you know, <laughs> you're, you're engaging in it, to, um, to actually get to grips with what's happening and all the changes and, and, and also how it's affecting, I mean, to actually find what, yeah. how it's affecting um, people on the ground. Now, I, I put my hand up very quickly because I'm not able to stay for very much longer. 
and but I did request that it was um, uh, recorded because you know I want to be able to go through this information because you've got such valuable information in there. But there were a couple of other things I wanted to throw in because we were in Cuba for four and a half months this year from mid December to first of May. And one of the things that came up, and, and you know, some of these ideas, you may have looked at them, but one of the things that came up is, for example, the public transport is it was only running at 40% of capacity. So, um, and that was because of the fuel, fuel shortages. And, and also what was, well, what was um, I was told by one of my neighbours is that or, you know, you said about the agricultural production was was oversupply. You might like to have a bit more of a look at that because part of the difficulty is, again, the distribution. So, so some areas have, um, uh, you know, their needs are satisfied in agricultural production. Other areas, it's very difficult for them to actually transport um, because of the fuel um, shortages. And I've been told that, you know, when we when we hear of electricity outages, you know, and, and power cuts, m my experience has previously been, well, it might be three or four hours. And I've been told, a friend messaged me the other day and said that, you know, fuel, fuel outages, sorry, electricity outages are going on for about 12 hours. Um, and but that's in Bayamo, that's not Havana. So, um, and then the other thing that I was just curious, I didn't see you mention was MLC, the the moneda libremente convertible, and the 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 kind of impact. Now that's a, a, a mega maze, as far as I can tell, but it impacts um because some people can't they don't actually have the foreign currency to put on their cards to buy in the mlc shops so it's just another idea that that i'm sure you want to look at and i just i just really want to congratulate you on all the work you've done so far um because i, I think there's an awful lot of cubans that can't even get to grips with why what's happening and why it's happening the way it's happening so Thanks, thank Jackie. You. Emily might just want to summarise a response to all of that because there are a couple of points in the chat as well. Thank well, you. Jackie. Very quickly, um, yeah, I can see, I can see that James Warren has has commented on that. Um, you know, we've been looking at transport in particular, and um, there's a huge problem with spares. Um, you know, the the, the uh, vehicles are very old. A lot of the the buses are out of commission, and you know, as I said, if you've got half of foreign exchange earnings disappearing half of your total spending was on food and fuel. The amount that you have left for spares is very low. And that is to do with the, the way that the bus company was run before. They, they run very, very old and inefficient and um, cranky old machines because, um, because labor is, well, because fuel has been historically relatively cheap, the way that they do their accounts. Um, whereas they should have been replacing these, these buses over time. But obviously under current conditions, they cannot because there is no foreign exchange. And I don't think that there's, a, there's an, uh, an issue there in a way of people's um, ability to understand how acute the foreign exchange situation is. I mean, you know, there is no money to buy spare parts, even if you can find them internationally. Um, and so the buses are, are out of commission. Um, that's, that's really important. The MLCs is very important. That's been a, a big focus of a lot of um, resentment, clearly. But it, you know, I didn't mention it because for me as an economist, that's just, that's just inflation. I mean, what's happened is that um, you, know, you, you, can, you can convert your, your Cuban pesos into, into um, MLCs but you're paying 120, you were paying 120 for one. And so effectively that was the price of those things. Now, I mean, the reason is because of shortages, because there's huge shortages. The way that it's been done, um, the creation of these different shops is a way of sort of segmenting the market. So that it's an attempt to separate what's not essential from what's essential. Clearly that hasn't happened because a lot of people are pointing out that just to get cooking oil, you've got to go to an MLC, 
MLC store. And that's been the huge point of contention. I don't think it, there was, there was never any easy solution to that. There simply were shortages. Um, and uh, yeah, you could say, okay, well, why don't they just sell everything in the MLC shop at the you know, 100 to one price? And then it would just look like inflation. It wouldn't look like exclusion, excluding people. But what they're trying to do is trying to gather the foreign exchange that there is in the country. And when I was there, it was really noticeable in November that the restaurants in Havana were actually full of Cubans. There are, there is a class of Cuban who has money, but when Jackie points out that there are many Cubans without any, it's actually not many, it's, it's an awful lot. It's probably most Cubans have no MLC. Um, so, you know, but there is this, this idea that this emerging inequality, this is supposed to be a way, they used to call them shops for you know, gathering foreign exchange. They're trying to, to pull in the foreign exchange. It's a very, yeah, it's a very contentious and it's far from ideal way of trying to do it. Um, but it does mean that as the exchange rate has appreciated, the Cuban peso has recovered a bit, then the effective price of things in the MLCs has fallen. But people don't appreciate, I mean, people don't acknowledge that because the price is still very, very high. Nobody's going to say, oh, it's not cheap. Like, you know, I only have to pay 85 um, Cuban pesos for, you know, a quarter of a litre of oil. Nobody's going to say that, but it is better, more affordable than it was. Anyway. Yeah. So, so, thank you. There are lots and lots of comments in the chat, people agreeing with you, people adding information, but I'm going to just focus on the question. So it, there's a question here from Ruby, who can't speak, she's in a noisy cafe, but she wants you to comment, or wants if you can comment, um, or if you know what kind of new plans there might be in terms of consciousness raising, etc., because of the kind of potential new contradictions which you laid out, such as the rise of the private sector, associated social problems and inequalities. So what's the, the question, sorry? So the question is, is there anything being done to address that cambio de mentalidad and how to raise consciousness, consciousness to have those principles all in place at the same time, to be socialist and not to veer towards... Yeah, I mean, uh, there is, and, you know, there, some people are getting the message, some people are, are learning. There's a, there's a lot of discussion going on. There are a lot of people who are too fed up to want to engage. I mean, but, you know, I'm not there. Um, I know the people that I know, and, and obviously the academics who I know are very unrepresentative sample because they're people who are trying to move on, trying to, to grapple with this um, new challenge that they've got. Um, but they're not the only people I know. I know a lot of other people who are seriously um, disillusioned, exhausted, um, tired, pessimistic um, as well. So there is the young people particularly talk about the failure of the government to communicate effectively. Um, and I think that that's, you know, they see that, they see that among them and their friends. And that's, that's a big serious issue, but I don't know what the solution to that is apart from sacking all the old people who don't understand young people. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't approve of that, obviously. Um, and we could probably do that in our own country as well, couldn't we? So that's a universal problem, I think. Exactly. Generational change. Um, other questions, other comments? There's a lot of people who are going to have to leave, but they're looking forward to the recording. Yep, thank you, Valia, for your comments. I'm sure Emily will read them when she catches up. But the, if anybody's got any questions, so Tony, you've got your finger waving at me. Are you asking a question? Yes. Can you okay. hear me? Yep. Good. It's all right. I seem to have disappeared off other, the other part of this <laughs> this broadcast. Um, a quick question, Emily. I can remember when you were anticipating some years back the possible fusion of the currencies. And I remember you saying that you thought that 24 to 1 uh, was an underestimate of the power of the coup and an overestimate of the power of the uh, convertible. And you anticipated, and I'm sorry to quote this to you, that the, if you were doing it, you would expect the logical fusion to be somewhere around eight or 10 to one. Now, assuming that, that you were right then, did they make a mistake by fixing it at 24? Um, well, Sid, it was preceded by this massive increase in, in pay. So there's a huge increase in the money supply, yeah? 
And so that would, um, would mean a rate which was weaker than 10 to one, yeah? So that would mean that you'd have to settle on something which was, so the more inflation you have in, in the peso economy, the lower its value is going to be. And so there, there has been inflation since that time. I'd still think it was probably about right then, but since that time there's been inflation. So the inflation was caused by the increase in, in, wage, in um, wages and therefore costs, but also because of the shortages. So under these circumstances, I think that the increase in wages would have made it 24 to one. The shortages would possibly make it 40 to one, 50 to one now. Um, so prices have increased by that much um, within Cuba. So, so say, I mean, the official measure of inflation says that it's something like 100% in increase over the past year. Um, that doesn't take into account, and I'm not sure exactly how they do their survey, their price survey, but it won't be taking into account the things that you can only get on the black market. And so, you know, the cost of living has gone up by more than 100% um, over that period. So um, it's interesting. What's The other thing that's happened in the last week, and this is I haven't got on top of, to be honest, is the there's been a lot of complaints from the new private sector and from the old private sector that they um, are not allowed to import in, they're not allowed to deal in, uh, in hard currency, they're not allowed to, to import. Um, so now there seems to be the creation of a, an intermediary exchange rate that's being used for allocating foreign exchange to enterprises. Now they want a, 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 a flat playing field, a, a level playing field. Therefore, that's going to be the same for state enterprises, for cooperatives, for private enterprises, companies, and for the self-employed. That's the idea. So there'll be an allocation of foreign exchange, which they've said won't be at 24 to one. It's going to be at another number. So now you're going to have three different levels. And then people are saying, is this the Venezuelanization of Cuba? You know, is this there going to be a you know a whole load of different exchange rates? Um, I my feeling is that there's going to be another another um, devaluation from 24 to one at some stage. And this may be the first step in that direction, but you know, I really don't know how, how they're planning to manage it. Um, so you've got like 85 to one, 95, 100 to one, and then you've got 24 to one, and then you've got another one halfway in the middle. So yeah, I need to find out more. Um, they seem, I mean, you know, when they made that announcement, they said that the condition of doing that is that people have to sell their product in Cuban pesos. So they want to increase the supply of goods in Cuban pesos and the prices obviously will be by negotiation. So it's an interesting kind of attempt again to manage this, this kind of square the circle or manage this process. Okay, yeah, thank I'm, you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Other questions, other comments? I might just jump in while people are thinking. So back to this kind of question of, you know, preserving an updated version of socialism and two areas where the playing field hasn't been level for a very long time are firstly remittances. I mean, certainly we noticed when we were there very recently that the people that had benefited from remittances over a sustained period of time have used the pandemic a little bit like we did. In other words, staying at home and accumulating a little bit to be able to fix the front garden or fix the whatever. There are some really very well furnished properties now in Havana. Yeah. I've never seen them looking, at least some of them, I haven't seen them looking so good, but that's a very, very small you know, uh, proportion of the state of housing in Havana and elsewhere in Cuba. And the other part of that, in terms of level playing fields is, you know, you're talking about local development plans and devolution of, of planning um, budgets to municipalities. That's been happening for a while. Is there something more autonomous now about those municipal budgets? Because the, they were called the Iniciativas de Desarrollo Municipal, but you had to apply to a provincial uh, body in order to be given funding. And it was a very uneven playing field at that stage. So is there anything different about that second one. No, well, I, I don't know the details of that. And okay. that is something that I really want to look into because it seems that things are happening. I mean, I saw things happening on the ground and I was like, you know, where did this money come from? I know that there was a Havana 
thing, you know, 500 years celebration and budgets were given for that. But there's more than that happening. And I don't exactly know the mechanism that it's happening. So that's the answer to your second one. The first one is really interesting. I mean, I, I've talked to, to expats who are living, you know, Brits who are living in Cuba, and they say they've never been as rich as they are now, right? Because the Cuban peso, again, is severely undervalued. So you can buy somebody to help you out with something, you know, the, the, um, it's the, the difference between people who have um, hard currency and people who don't is bigger when you have that, that exchange rate difference. Um, so definitely, and they were actually complaining, they're saying it's ridiculous, we're paying, we're paying cents for our fuel. This isn't right <laughs> from a climate change point of view or any, you know, it's wrong. Um, we're going out for a meal, it only costing us $2, you know, that's crazy. Um, so those people are very well off. I think the other thing is, from what it seemed to me, there were people in receipt of remittances, there were also people making a lot of money on the black market, um, currency exchange. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of activity going on there and it's created a lot of opportunities for people to make quite easy money. Um, so yeah, all of that is going on. Um, and so, you know, as the exchange rate appreciates and somebody has put in the, I was trying to read the, the chat that, you know, I'm over optimistic about which way the exchange rate's going. I think in the end, the exchange rate, according to economics, should reach an equilibrium where the, the purchasing power in both currencies is, you know, supposed to move towards a similar level. No, the purchasing power is not, the, the currency is not a purchasing power parity at the moment. The problem is shortages. So if the supply can increase in Cuban pesos, the Cuban peso will appreciate. So um, that's, that's how I'd answer that question. If there are more shortages, the Cuban peso won't, it will fall again. Okay, so that's that's great. Thank you. There's just a, a barrage of questions coming in in the chat. And then Jean, I'm going to come to you in a minute, Jean, but I'm going to read Ruby's question, which is quite long. What might be the impact of the international situation in terms of what some people are predicting in terms of international economics and the rise of China and the Russian ruble? I read recently that the ruble was outperforming the US dollar for the first time. Not sure how accurate that is and if it would have an impact on Cuba. Feel free to ignore it <laughs> as it might be quite tangential. Um, um, also, I what do you think is the main factor which could improve conditions for people who are tired and disillusioned, calling for the end of the blockade as an emergency method, measure or other, other measures that people want? Lots of questions. Yeah, I mean, you know, the end, of, the end of the blockade would make a huge difference, no doubt about that, but I don't think people are really expecting that to happen. Um, you know, there'd be um, partial things. The rise of the China and Russia, Cuba clearly has been cultivating its relations with China and Russia and with Iran and with the Caribbean and with everybody else as well. Um, it's, it's never gonna be what it was before, um, but it does mean, you know, everybody knows that the US is losing its um, dominant, you know, its dominant position is weakening. Um, and so, I mean, I think Cuba's been, well, been quite clever, I'd say, but also been forced to be clever in, in terms of its very active diplomatic activity. It doesn't, it doesn't amount to, um, you know, a savior in terms of being able to boost the economy that strongly, but it, it, it's, it's a lifeline. Okay, and then somebody else, should I go for the next question? You, you can go for it yourself. That's Lauren asking about the use of cryptocurrency, and then we'll come to Jean, and then we'll come to Al, okay. and then you can probably go and have a lie down. Yeah, the cryptocurrency. Oh, and Alpha as well. All right. Three more, and that's it. Um, <laughs> sorry about the cryptocurrency uh, question, Emily. <laughs> I was at you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I had to answer this question for a, a, a journal called Central Banker um, recently, and I, I said, you know, I I don't do cryptocurrency. I don't know about it, but I mean, cryptocurrencies, and I've been trying to get on top of it. Cryptocurrency is a lot of different things, and as they said in the Financial Times. And one is this blockchain mechanism for making payments. And it seems that's a useful tool. A lot of the cryptocurrency uh, fluff is just speculation in various different um, products that people are, are buying and they go up and down as we know, they've gone right down in price recently. Um, but as, as a mechanism, as a um, you know, blockchain payment systems, the, use, the fact that Russia is now um, sanctioned and so can't use dollars as you know, like Cuba puts them in the same boat. So, you know, you can see, obviously they're working on it. Um, it's not good to, to be operating in um, currencies or payment systems that are not transparent. 
because then you lose the um, approval of the anti-money laundering um, system, which is the OECD, um, what the name of it, but anyway, the FATF, anyway. Um, and Cuba has a clean bill of health on that, and it had to get a clean bill of health in order to renegotiate the Paris Club Agreement, and in order to ever come back into being able to borrow any money not just long-term money, but just money for trade. You know, you need to have a clean bill of health on those things if and when the listing of as being a state sponsor of terrorism is lifted, Cuba wants to get regain access to international markets. So they have to be careful um, and they are being cautious, but they're not ruling it out. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's great. Um, there are people leaving and thanking you. So we're gonna to go to Jean, Al and Alpha in that order. Over to you, Jean. Okay, thanks, Pa. <clears throat> Great, Emily. Um, You're a bit faint. Can you hear me? Only faintly. Let me just see if I can turn off my, turn up my... No, I think she's faint for all of us. If you can shout, Jean, or just turn up your volume. Either one is good. <laughs> How about if I shout? <laughs> I can hear you now. I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. Um, yeah, no, thanks. I mean, you know, looking at the economy from the outside, it just looks... A mess. Um, so to have some sort of sense of things that might be happening. Um, but I have two very specific questions. One follows on from Pa, um, having mentioned the municipalities. Um, we all know what happened here with devolving um, power, so to speak, to local councils that if you're a rich council, you do much better than if you're a poor council. And Cuba has richer and poorer, or maybe poor and poorer <laughs> municipalities. So how are they going to manage um, funding to go to enable the programs? And are they going to allow municipalities to access money abroad. For example, someone wants to donate money to restore a theatre or a cinema in the local municipality. Um, the other is the universities. Is the model that they're thinking of with the incubators really taken from what was happening in the policy in Difficult, um, where science and especially medicine was being used, uh, the, the, the scientists were actually working with those who were going to be producing the medicines and, and it was fused with industry. So is that the incubator model? Okay, so there's three questions there. First of all, um, is devolution to municipal level going to increase inequality between municipalities? That's a million dollar question. It's not that they're not aware of it. It's obviously important to have some kind of system for, for central allocation of funds to particularly vulnerable poor municipalities. I don't know how it's work, working. There's something for Lauren to go and do in Cuba to, to investigate. Um, second one, um, yes, the answer is yes. Municipalities, every, there is an attempt to create, open up channels for foreign donations or investments, equity shares, or whatever, to, um, to reach all entities. So that is on the cards. The systems are not in place at the moment. So, and it's, it's quite a heated debate, you know, because there's a resistance, a resistance from partly because they always feel they have to vet anybody who's coming in from outside, which is, you know, the security issue. Um, and partly because they don't have the mechanisms and because, you know, bureau some bureaucrats are just used to saying no. Now, Jean seems to have disappeared from my picture, but I don't know. Um, so, uh, yes, in principle, but in practice, that we're, we're not there yet. On universities, yes, indeed, the policy in Pifico was definitely um, a model. Um, it applies differently to different kinds of industries and all the rest of it. But that is, you know, they've repeatedly said they want to... Um, extend that model, um, the success of, of what they managed to do there to other areas. Um, so we're working at the moment with the people in the chemistry department doing battery technologies um, 
and they're trying to link in and they have got links with the enterprises in the energy sector and they're trying to um, you know work together but they said that previously they never spoke to the people in the ministry now they're talking to the people in the ministry so it's like government agencies enterprises and universities attempting to get together to work out what's the way to do it but this kind of horizontal what they call horizontal linkages you know is is something new for so many people they've been working in these top-down silos for so many years um, there isn't the architecture, there isn't the structure for it at the moment. So that's why the incubators, are, it's kind of role that the incubators are supposed to be playing is to, to try and do that. It's, I mean, it's potentially very exciting, but also extremely frustrating for people who are doing it. Um, and I don't underestimate how hard it is to do. Thanks, Emily. So Al, nice to see you, Al, and then Alpha. Oh, you're on mute. Can't hear you're on mute. <laughs> Got it. You can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Par. Um, Emily, very nice talk. Um, yeah, I realize there's a technical glitch that sent us over to Jitsi, but I just want to say it worked out great for me because I missed every part of the beginning where you outlined all the problems. So I came in just when you were beginning to outline how good things are going. And it made me feel a lot better because, you know, I was really worried about the economy before, but I'm feeling very positive now. I'm missing all that other stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the recording as well. But the one question I really have is that um, on inflation, you know, I mean, you outlined the reasons very clearly. The money chasing goods is up. The goods being chased are down. So you get inflation. That's that's pretty clear. But it, it's, a, it's always hard to calculate inflation when you have these multiple currencies, just like it used to be before. And now we're getting back to that with, you know, the MLC and now maybe different exchange rates. And the question I wanted to ask is that other piece, and, and you, you can't give an exact answer, but just a ballpark figure. What, what does the ration card do anymore? I mean, I, I know it's weak. I know you can't live on it, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, let's forget about the people that are doing all right in Cuba. And let's just look at the people that are trying to get by. Does it provide 40% of their needs? Does it I, I know the poorer you are, the higher it's going to get. But does it provide 10%? Can you give any just ballpark figure? Or is it totally meaningless? Um, can you give some feeling of what the ration card does now and what it means? Yeah, well, thanks for that question. I mean, all the questions are, are great. I mean, that that is a really, it's a really important question. And I should know the answer to that, I suppose. I mean, what they did do at the beginning of the crisis, I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, is they increased the amount of basic foods on the ration, which was a very, you know, very necessary, positive move. Um, and, you know, I know people in Cuba who got too much rice at the end of the month, um, you know, but that's, that's people who got something else as well. Um, I think, I mean, so people did estimate before that it covered 40% of the monthly needs. Um, so as it's increased, as long as the supply is regular, then it would be more than that. Um, but that depends on whether the supplies are coming in. It looks like this is by, by just looking at what people are not complaining about. <laughs> I haven't seen any outrage, and um, maybe somebody else could tell me about this, at uh, the ration goods not coming. Now, if that is the case, that is actually quite an achievement. And it's better than in the special period because in the special period, they were really, the ration goods weren't arriving. So that represents an enormous effort on the part of the government um, to try to, to maintain that guarantee. And I do think, um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that anything is good in Cuba at the moment because I know, and everybody knows that it's terrible, right? But I think we should give credit for that. And that's kind of the problem with the government's communication because they keep asking people to recognize how much effort they put into this <laughs> to try to guarantee the basics. And people are not satisfied with that for good reasons. You know, if you're standing in a queue for that many hours, you're hardly going to be congratulating anybody for, for doing what they've done. Um, but it is an achievement in a way that's that's the same story in the special period, because when I wrote my article 
on the special period. And I just looked at the mortality rates compared, comparing Cuba to other countries in the um, post-Soviet world. And, you know, it was remarkable how people had stayed alive. Um, so that's not in any way to pretend that officials behave well all the time, uh, that they behave efficiently or, or anything, but it's, it does show that the system is still functioning. I think we couldn't understand why it survives unless you acknowledge that this is the case. Anyway, so I'll say that, but I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, I should do. Um, and maybe I'll go and have a look at somebody's um, ration collection and measure the calories in it um, when I go over. Thanks, Emily. And then Alpha. Um, and if uh, anybody else has got a question, just have it ready to go because we may let Emily go very soon. Thank you. And, and thank you very much to see you, Emily. Um, that's very nice to see. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, First of all, I, I, I wanted to, um, to emphasize the fact that, yes, it is difficult for the Cuban. They experience every day a difficult situation, queuing up, getting food and other things. But yet, I was there on the 1st of May. And what I saw, what I really saw was that over 5 million people responded to the call of their leadership and to the revolution. And they march in every single corner of Cuba. Now, what's happened in 11th of July, obviously manufactured from Miami, Argentina and Spain. How can that be reconciled with the economic situation of the difficulties that they live in this moment, but yet politically involved and politically adherent to their revolution? <laughs> how, how do you see that in the future? Is there a likely event happening again like that? Or because of what they show on the 1st of May will temper that. What is the economic situation and the political situation? That Those contradictions, how do you see that, Emily? Okay, um, well, when July 11th happened, you know, for me, it was a reflection of the economic situation. You know, watching what had happened to the economy over the previous year and what was happening in the middle of that year, it wasn't surprising that a lot of people were fed up and, you know, there was a huge level of frustration, all the rest of it. But clearly it wasn't just that. There was other things going on. There were people who were fed up with the cultural policy. There were people who were also stirring it from outside. Um, I think it was a shock to the, to the government. I mean, this is, this is going beyond my remit, but I'll, I'll say anyway. I think it was a huge shock to the government because they had been working incredibly hard. And I think that they felt that it, it was unjustified, the amount of anger that there was, but there was anger on the street. There was frustration and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, it was a shock and it also, I think, um, precipitated an urgency for um, trying to improve communication participation. Um, and, you know, it's very imperfect. There's an awful lot more to do. But this emphasis on participation on the people in vulnerable communities, as they describe them, um, is something which has always been there, but it's it's definitely, you know, it's got a new impetus in the last, I would, I would say in the last six, eight months. Um, and, you know, what's going on on the ground in communities is in a way a response to that. It's a, an acknowledgement that the government had seemed distant. The government still seems distant in many ways. But you know, if you're participating at a local level, you feel differently towards how problems can be solved. So I think it's, what should we say, it's a necessity. It's born of necessity because um, July the 11th brought it home to anybody who wasn't convinced that there was something wrong. Um, and so it, it created an imperative. Um, I, I would argue against anybody who says that the economic reforms are due to July the 11th, they were always on the cards. But the, um, the amount of effort that's going into the participatory aspect and the local government aspect, I think is something which has been precipitated 
um, by that. I mean, it was interesting. I was there in November when, you know, the 2nd, July the 11th was supposed to happen. And clearly, you know, the, the moment had passed um, for lots of reasons. But I mean, you could actually see it in the exchange rate was, was and prices were stabilizing. So the, the moment of panic was over. Um, so I, you know, I would say that the, the shortages, the uncertainty, the fear um, had dissipated. It's not to say that it can't come back and it's not to say that things are fine at all. And, you know, we've got another summer ahead of us. A lot of young people are really pissed off. They feel they're not being listened to and so on. So, you know, um, but I would say that the probability is, is lessened. And like you say, a lot of people are um, less shy about talking about their young people, about their support for, for what the government's trying to do, which is kind of a bit of a turning point. That's my, my impression, but somebody can, can uh, contradict me. How about you, Willie? <laughs> Being a young person. <laughs> Putting Willie on the spot there, Willie, if you want to contradict <laughs> Emily, go ahead. Go ahead. There's a, there's a whole aspect of new technologies, of social media, of the increase of internet access during the pandemic and the implications of all of that for how people are responding and how they're communicating within Cuba, but also between Cuba and other places. So it's very complicated. So that's our next discussion when I meet you, um, Willie. With, you can tell me what's happening. <laughs> Obviously, got something to say about it. Yeah, he is. He's gonna. He's. He will. He will get there, no doubt. Any last comments or questions? Emily, you can tell from the number of questions and comments. We could probably keep you here for the rest of the evening, but we're not going to, thankfully right. for you. Well, it's really nice to see everybody. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much. It's a shame we're not in Nottingham, you know. So hopefully September, if, all, if the waters stay nice and calm in September, we will see some of you in Nottingham on campus for the conference, and that would be really be great. Yeah, that would be great. It'd be really nice to see people after all this time. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. The recording will go onto YouTube. Bye, -bye everybody. Bye. Bye.